Nigerian Labour Congress and LC appears to be ready for a showdown with the federal government as the union prepares for a two-day working strike over the effects of removal of fuel subsidy. And the Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, Mr. Wali Adun, has ruled out the economic agenda of the Tunisian government and how the new government hopes to fix the very disturbing state of the economy. Tonight, we have an exclusive conversation with one of the state governors tonight on the program. So stick around with me, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure having you join us tonight on the program. This is Politics Today, live on China's television. I'm Sean Wakimale in Abuja. Let's begin the conversation tonight by letting you know what the government of the Bala Ahmed Tinubu uh, is planning. The Tinubu government is optimistic that they will turn around the economic uh, the situation in the country despite the agonizing declaration that the economy is in a worrying state. The Minister of Finance and Coordinator Minister for the Economy, Mr. Wale Edo, today at a press conference spoke about the agenda of the government. You highlighted the new government's plan. It says that two billion are so far been released to each state government from the five billion Naira earmarked for palliative and cushioning effect in light of the removal of few subsidies. Take a listen to Mr. Waliadu. You cannot remove a subsidy without having some effect on inflation. You cannot correct, remove a subsidy on foreign exchange without the rate going up and without having some hardship as a result of the inflationary effect. And Mr. President, while campaigning, he promised Nigerians that the poor, the vulnerable, would not be left behind. They would not be left to fend for themselves. And that is why he put in place an incentive or a, a, a intervention rather package that not only put fertilizer in the hands of the farmers and food, grains, rice on the tables of Nigerians. He also put in place a 500 billion Naira in, in intervention package to produce food, to support the move to mass transit CNG fueled buses, to support small scale industries, nano industries, the micro industries, I should call them. That's the Minister of uh, the Economy and the coordinating, uh, the Minister of Finance, coordinating Minister for the Economy. Mr. Wally Adun. At that press conference, the Minister of Budget and National Planning was there. Uh, the Director General of um, uh, the um, uh, the Director, the, the Special Advisor to the President on uh, Revenue was there. The uh, the Chair of uh, the Presidential Committee uh, on Taxation and Tax Reforms was also there, and Ms. Oniha, uh, who is. Uh, the, uh, the, the DG of uh, the debt management office was also there. And a few uh, of, uh, officials uh, in relation to the issue of the economy were there. Among them is also the DG, uh, the manager, group managing director of the NNPC, uh, Mr. Mele Kiari, was one of the officials at the event where he gave an account of the state of oil production in Nigeria. We, he said it has risen from about about a million liter per day to almost a million six hundred per day now take a listen to what he said and uh, in, uh, in terms of what nigeria is uh, perhaps earning and of course what uh, nigeria is this uh, dismissing as uh, uh, the number of fuel uh, discharged to the nigerian market every day in the total volume of PMS that is consumed in this country. This also means reduction of 30% of foreign exchange requirements. It means that whatever we have that we must put forward to provide PMS, that component of it will be available to show up our FX environment. 
And secondly, with the growing market and the prices that are good today, we know that you know that FX stability is well within sight, and NMPC is already making some FX payments into the necessary uh, transaction accounts, and it's already sharing of our FX. And this is also a good moment to to, re to respond to a number of uh, media uh, conversations going on around the Afrexim loan. That it has collapsed, it's no longer going to be possible. It is not a law, it is a forward sale. And forward sale is the easiest deal. You are simply selling your items for tomorrow, and banks don't have problem funding this. So not, this is not the type of transaction that will ever collapse when it's fully clear that the volume that you are selling are already on the table and it is known to your, uh, your, your, your partners. Some of what they've said will form part of our first conversation on the program tonight. So stay around with me because we need to serve you with our political roundup stories. The wife of the president, Senator Oluremi Tinubu, has asked women in Imo State to support the re-election bid of the Imo State Governor of Opus Adimma during the November 11 governorship election in Imo State. Mrs. Tinubu was speaking at the grand finale of the 2023 Women August Meeting in Ower, the Imo State Capital, where she told the gathering that the Opus Adimma administration has done a lot for the women folk in the state and asked them to mobilize support for the governor. Ahead of the judgment of the presidential election petition court, Retired Justice Mary Peter Odili, the chairman of the body of benches, is appealing to Nigerians to refrain from engaging in actions that could jeopardize the unity of Nigeria as a nation. She was speaking at a colloquium organized by senior advocate of Nigeria, Joe Kiari Gadzama in Abuja, under the theme, The Nigeria of Our Dreams. Justice Odili emphasized that while it is natural for politicians who lose elections to feel like greed, it is insufficient for anyone to express their frustrations without a sense of responsibility. All is now set for the Edo State Local Government Council elections, scheduled for Saturday, the 2nd of September, 2023. In an interview with newsmen in Benin, the state capital, the chairman of the Edo State Independent Electoral Commission assures that all the non-sensitive materials have been deployed to all the 18 local government areas of Edo State, while sensitive materials are ready to be deployed before the end of Friday. He advised the electorate to exercise their franchise by voting for the candidates of their choice, assuring that the electoral body will be fair to all parties. This night, this materials will leave the wars to the different polling units. And you remember we have 4,519 throughout the states. In Delta State, an Ijo group of the APC won the national leadership of the APC to include the Ijo extraction in the Governorship Campaign Council for the Bayelsa and Imo State Governorship election. Addressing a news conference in Worry, the APC group also wants President Bola Tinubu to consider the region for appointment into federal government agencies and board of past statehoods. We do not want to bother ourselves with past, but worried with present happenings as to the appointment and the purported composition of the Baeza State Campaign Council. On the program, let's begin tonight by letting you know what the labor, the organized labor, is up to. The Nigerian Labor Congress, especially the NLC, has declared a two-day warning strike beginning on Tuesday, the 5th of September, in protest of what they say is the federal government's failure to address the challenges caused by the removal of fuel subsidy. The NSC president, Mr. Joe Ajairo, made the declaration today at a press conference in Abuja where uh, he, they were reading out the reasons why uh, they will be going on that two-day warning strike, especially based on the resolutions by the NLC National Executive Committee meeting which was held uh, yesterday. The Labour Union is accusing the federal government of abandoning the negotiations and failing to implement some of the resolutions from previous meetings with the government. Next in session, resolve as follows. To embark on a total and indefinite shutdown of the nation within 14 working days or 21 days from today until steps are taken by the government to address the excruciating mass suffering and the impoverishment being experienced around the country. To commence a two-day nationwide warning strike 
on Tuesday and Wednesday, 5th and 6th of September 2023, to demonstrate our readiness for the indefinite strike later in the month. Let's get some more details of this plan and how uh, the NRC hope to achieve this, what it means for the Nigerian people, how much of a message it will be for the Tunubu government and the impact this may have on the, the policy. I'm being joined by the president of the Nigerian Labour Congress, Mr. Joe Ajero, who joins us virtually from Abuja. Thank you so much, Mr. Ajero, for joining us tonight. It does look like a new twist to the engagement between Labour and the federal government. It, I mean, does it look like things are broken down between both parties in terms of the negotiation that you have entered into in the past weeks? You will recall that after our nationwide protests, you know, there were promises from the National Assembly that asked for one week. And uh, after a meeting one-on-one -on -one with Mr. President, for him to restructure the team, you know, negotiation for government. Between that time and now, no communication. So you can see that negotiation has not even commenced, talk less of, you know, breaking down. So that's where we are. There's no communication. Nobody talks to us. You know, uh, it, it does seem to be a monologue. We are talking to ourselves and they are talking to themselves. We can't continue this way three months after the removal of first subsidy and the excruciating effect of this policy to Nigerians. So, uh, I thought that there were supposed to be some consultations, some committees are supposed to meet and look at the way forward. Um, is it that they're not talking to you at all, or uh, you just feel that there is a stalling on the side of the federal government? There were committees set up at inception when we wanted to embark on a strike. The committees couldn't meet for almost six weeks when we started pressing on the issue for us to do a nationwide rally for Nigerians to know, you know that nothing is happening. So before that rally, you know, there were attempts for the committee to hold meetings with us in two very occasions. You know, there was no seriousness attached to the meeting. And it was at that point that we asked that, you know, the composition of the committee should be enhanced so that people who are not too busy with state matters, you know, could take part in the committee, especially on part of the government. You know, and it was on that basis that we equally met with the Senate president, we met with President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and between that time and now, you know, uh, not no communication. That is the true situation. Now, you have decided to go on a two-day warning strike, but you have also hinted that there will be an indefinite strike action later in the month. Uh, this is in view of uh, the court, the, the, the federal government going to the, uh, the industrial court uh, to stop the Nigerian labor from doing any of such? Well, I don't think the, the matter has anything to do with court. The two days action are in two prongs. The first point there is the takeover of the National Secretary of the National Union of Road Transport Employees by people, you know, claiming that they, they have authority of the villa to take over the leadership. And to us in the trade union movement, it is unfortunate, it is even worse than, you know, the queue in Niger for you to violently use the police to take over, you know, an elected government of an industrial union. And we have given the police 48 hours to pull out and allow the union to resolve their crisis, or the NLC, which is their umbrella union, or even other organs, Ministry of Labor, or all the organs set by law, to take care of it and not the police. That is the first step. And the second step is, you know, is on the, towards the uh, industrial action over the issue of uh, refusal of the state to engage labor and to solve the problem and the continued suffering of Nigerian workers, you know, to give it as a signal. We have given a long, you know, uh, notice up to the middle of, towards the third week of September, but uh, towards that end, we had to give a signal, a warning signal, that 
after this period, we are going to embark on an action and we're going to express that right, you know, of a worker to, the, to wake up and say he will not go to work. It's a right that you can legislate into existence or out of existence that people have the right to work or not to work. So we'll express it, you know, from the way you are saying, we decide, we'll find out whether anybody who decides not to go to work will be arrested or will be imprisoned. Well, look, let's look at it this way. Now, so uh, with all what the federal government says it is doing, for example, 5 billion naira has been earmarked. The Minister of Finance today has said 2 billion out of that money has been disbursed already. Is the Labour okay with that arrangement? And they're saying more is to come. What is that 5 billion naira for? Is it for, for what? Is it for... We, we, we don't have information when the federal government is giving a location to state governments, you know, on and on. So how does that concern us? The federal government continued allocation to states, whether it's five billion, whether it's ten billion. <clears throat> how does that concern level? Is there any agreement around that for what it is meant for? Or well, what one, will, one will imagine, Mr. Jairo, that your members are all over the country. And they will benefit from the disbursement how, of this money. How are, they, how are they going to benefit? In a state where you have 3 million people, you know, and you send 5 billion naira, do you think anybody can get 1,000 naira? I, I don't think we should be bothered with that uh, calculation. It doesn't add water. You know, even if you have to take it to give it to the poor, and the Na National Bureau of Statistics have said that one. 133 million Nigerians are multidimensionally poor in Nigeria. So and you calculate 185 billion and you release to them and give them maybe 1,300. Is that what you are talking about? Is that how the Nigerian state looks at its citizens? But, but look at it this way. Um, so clarify for us. Is it that you do not trust the state government or you think <coughs> that that money that was earmarked is insufficient? <laughs> Or that the idea of the palliative is that totally is not, out of place. That, what exactly is the point of labor? That, that money is not for us. We are negotiating with government. We are trying to look at the effects, you know, of the subsidy remover. And we have not arrived on five five billion for you to share one one thousand to people. You know, if government is giving the uh, money to the state governors for them to share, that's not within the the mandate we have in terms of negotiating with the Nigerian government or the committee they have set up. And you should be aware that almost on a monthly basis, government is sending money to state governments. So we should not bother ourselves with this issue of they gave state governors five billion. You know, is five billion for palliative? Is five billion for who? You know, how around will five billion go? Is it shared capitalism? So, so Mr. Ajaro, from the labor point of view, <laughs> that five billion is not non-issue. That five billion is out of place. Is that the stance of labor? That five billion, we don't know what it's all about. There was you do no not agree with the five billion. You do not there think that no, the federal government should discuss no it at all. The federal government and the governor discuss about the five billion and they are given to them. To us as labor, there was no conversation around five billion on what it is meant for. So we can't even pay any state governor that decides to fix it in a fixed deposit account. So let me ask you, uh, Mr. Ajayo, with what is on the ground right now, as far as the palliative measures, uh, subsidy regime, and what is the position of labor? Have you agreed that it's okay for the federal government to remove it? Are you, are you, are you on the same page with the federal government? Well, you, you, are, you, are part, you are in this country that there was no consultation around that, but the federal government has removed it. So it's not a question of whether we agreed or not, because we never agreed to that. You know, that, that any country should run without subsidizing the life of people in whatever guise, whether it is farmers, whether it is the energy or whatever. But they have done it. And when you do it, you don't reduce us to mere technism, maybe give us 10,000 10, for one or three months and leave people to die. You know, that's not the issue. You know, we we'll have to sit down and look at some measures, you know, that will push on the effect or that will substitute the suffering, you know, of Nigerians. So by the time you say you are giving state governors five, five billion, what does that translate to? So, so, share... so and, uh, Mr. President, give us an understanding of labor's own way 
of going about this? What is your own blueprint in handling this case? Because it doesn't look like the federal government is capable. It doesn't look like the federal government is doing the right thing. It doesn't look like the go federal government is knowledgeable enough in the eye of labor in handling this situation. That is what it appears to be from the position of the labor. Is that it? And what will be the labor's own blueprint in handling this situation? Chairman, let's look at this this way. You know, uh, like I said, if we share that five billion, or even the five trucks of uh, rice or grains, you, many people may not get one cup or half cup of rice. If you share the five billion, many people probably within the working class or you know the people who are the poor of the poor, the poorest of the poor, the wretched of the earth. Many people may not get 1,500. Now, is that the palliative? But if you take this money, and then like some of the suggestions we are looking at, like the CNG you know, uh, uh, gas, and we get buses in the states, I'm just giving you an example because of the question you asked. You get maybe in every state, maybe 100 buses. For every day, a worker moves from his uh, house to the office and comes back with a reduced transportation rate, he may save 1,000 naira a day. And if he tries that for 28 days or even 20 days, he may be saving about 20,000 on transportation alone. That's a policy. And then that will help even the farmer, you know, who moves his goods and services from one point to the other. This time around, we are not no longer talking of workers alone. We are talking of an action state, taken by the Nigerian state to reduce the excruciating effect of the subsidy remover. That alone. And by the time you do it nationwide, with these vehicles that their prices have been reduced to a barest minimum, you will see that people can move from one place to the other and fend for themselves. Not up to 20 million Nigerians are even on government paid employment. Other people in the public sector, sorry, the private sector, other people in the informal sector, how are they going to how are they going to benefit? You know, and this is a, these are some of the areas who can meet and converse around it. That's why we are saying, even the fact that some governors are saying that it is a loan, if it is a loan to the governors, some of them may not bother to take such loan. So that is the situation. There are various ways we could have conversed and every Nigerian, it will impact on them. We can look at even the issue of conversion for people that use private vehicles. And when they convert their, their vehicles, those that fill their tanks with 40,000 at a go will be filling it by 20,000 at a go. And then they will be selling close to 20,000. And not where somebody will give you 1,000 or 1,500. We can think, we can converse around these issues. We can think outside the box. But when people appropriate to themselves a monopoly of knowledge, then those are the kind of challenges we are going to continue. When we have institutionalized the attitude of sharing money, you know, then that's where we are. Uh, Mr. Jairo, so let's bring this home quickly. Now, for the interest of the Nigerian people, uh, what will be right in your own view that the government must, because a warning strike means if you do not do this, we will go ahead to go uh, on a larger, on a full scale. It means that labor will go on the streets, if I'm, a, if I'm right, and you will shut down every aspect of the Nigerian economy where your members are handling. Uh, that to me looks like an extreme situation. You will do that for two days, and if the government is not listening, you will do that indefinitely. Is that what is happening? Now, if that is what? the case, that means that adding to the worrying state of the economy, you are shutting down the policy. Well, I don't understand what you mean by extreme case. I would expect channels not to, you know, air anything on that day as a mark of protest to what is happening, to protest the effect on channels, to protest the effect on the workers, you know, of such areas. That is what we are going to do. We, may cons we are going to consider whether we'll be on the streets, like you mentioned, or whether we should be in our houses. Even in the NLC office, from even today, none of us will be around because we can't come to work. And we have been experiencing this for a very long time. 
you know, people cannot live from one place to the other. So on that day, it's going to be phenomenal. You know, it's going to be a symbol that this is a day, you know, that we couldn't afford to go to work, no matter what you are paid. And these two days is going to be so. So uh, I don't know what you mean by extreme situation in this regard. So, so what I mean, that, I mean, when you're saying, suggesting that channels were, I mean, uh, the, the channel's television is in solidarity with the Nigerian people. And okay, we've okay. always done that. We're on the side of the people. And of course, we always uh, constitutionally take the plight of the Nigerian people through the government and hold government accountable. That has been uh, the fulcrum of our operations and that has been the pillar of our vision and mission on this channel. So we've been doing that. But then we will go out and make sure that the Nigerian people get the right information, even on that day, as a solidarity for our nation. But the question I'm asking is that the Nigerian nation is already in a dire situation. If you show that aspect of the economy or aspect of our polity, it then means that things will go wrong. And that's what I'm saying. It might be extreme. Things are already bad. Uh, is there any other or possibility of uh, uh, any options other than uh, shutting out everything, like you planned. This, this will get worse for which people. The economy is done for which people. Those of us that can't move from one point to the other. I think you should get it from that perspective. The resources of the state, who is it meant for? Is it not for the people? And the people are not receiving it. It's good we look at it from that point of view. You are telling me that the economy of Nigeria is down. If you must situate it as being down, then it then means the workers are down. They can't go out. And I think it's part of the responsibility of the media, which happen to be my primary constituency, will be to ask the government that three months after the removal of first subsidy, what have you done? In fact, this conversation should have been for those the operators of the state, you know, to explain to Nigerians what they have been expecting Nigerian people, you know, what they have been expecting the masses, you know, to be doing in these past three months. Why it should be even some of them should go into the aspect of even demolishing houses meant for these workers, creating more hardship, creating a class war between the rich and the poor, and the level of even allocation of resources for those in national assembly, at the point you are telling me that the economy is down, at the point that the worker cannot feed, at the point he cannot enter taxi, are they sensitive, are they insensitive to the plight of the workers, or to the economy you are talking about that is down? I don't think that we have to think of one side you know, the bourgeois side of the economy, of bourgeois side of the economy being down, and not the worker side, not the masses. The masses cannot breach again. All right, the president himself said it, that uh, uh, we should allow the poor to breathe. Uh, we should not suffocate them. Uh, I mean, it seems to me to be, uh, that there is even no middle class these days, it's just the poor and the extreme rich. And those of us who belong to the poor, uh, whether or not we are breathing, I, I, I mean, the nation needs to move forward. And those who are uh, at the end of affairs need to do the right thing to allow the nation itself to breathe. But thank you so much indeed, the NSA President Joe Ajayro. And I wish you and your colleagues the best if it's in the interest of our nation. And we know that this nation will be great again. Thank you so much, Joe Ajayro, President of the NLC. Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate Bless you. We go on a break. And when we return, I'll be speaking with one of the state governors and we'll be talking about an election coming in that state in a few uh, weeks and some of the politics and the issues bothering the state of the nation. Don't go anywhere, everyone. We'll be right back. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us. Today, the first lady... Senator Uluwemi Tinubu was in Imo State and has asked uh, all young and old women in Imo State to support Governor Hopu Zodima's re-election bidding in November 11 governorship election by voting massively for him. Mr. Tinubu made his appeal during the grand finale of the 2023 Women's August meeting held at the Indubisi Kano Square in Oweri, the state capital. According to the First Lady, the APC administration of Uzodema has done a lot for women folk in the state, especially by picking a woman as his running mate. The president's wife, who was the special guest of honor, reiterated the commitment of the Tirumbu administration to making Nigeria a more prosperous nation, which all citizens will be proud of. 
amidst all of this, had a special focus on how state governments are dispersing palliative and funds given by the federal government. Two billion now that we understand to cushion the effect of the removal of fuel subsidy. Now, the eyes of Nigerians are on three governorship elections, Bayelsa, Imo, and Kogi state governorship election. In those uh, three states, two of the governors are seeking re-election, including the governor of Imo state, Senator Opuzonima, who is our guest tonight on the program. He joins us live from Uweri, the capital of Imo state. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for joining us tonight. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Sean. It seems you're doing everything possible to get a lot of people on your side for your re-election. Part of the event today was just some tacit campaign for, for you, for your re-election, by the very uh, the first lady, Senator Olura Mitunobu. Although the campaigns have not been uh, lifted yet, but it does look like you're making every effort to get to convince as many people. But I mean, why should people then look into your side for this election? Well, <clears throat> you know, the, what happened to the Nemo State today is the usual annual uh, women convention. It has become a tradition in Nemo State that every August, Imo women come together, they meet at the local government level, and they meet at the state level, which usually is called their grand finale, and the convention where the wife of the governor would use the opportunity to address Imo women on important issues that will help alleviate the sufferings of the people. They usually take advantage of the opportunity of the occasion to empower indigent women, empower widows, and also show concern to the yearnings and challenges that confront our people, our women in Imo State. This year's August meeting grand finale featured the first lady of the country as our special guest of honor. It was a very colorful occasion in the uh, Imo women, particularly the widows, were also empowered, some through economic empowerment of cash donations, food items, equipment for the various skills and enterprises for the women to go into business. And what is very significant, Imo women came today together to agree that the henceforth that they have to work together as women to be able to advance the cause of womanhood in the country. And it was a very interesting occasion. Uh, Governor Uzodema, at this point, I, I'm very certain that you have collected the two billion that has been disbursed by the federal government. How have you used it? Well, very simple. That is the magnanimity of federal government headed by President Bola Mectinimbo. Uh, we met with the president, with the governors, and uh, there the president uh, uh, approved the disbursement of four billion naira, not even two billion, four billion naira to the subnational to help alleviate the sufferings occasioned by the policy of removal of poor subsidy. Out of the four billion naira, two billion naira has been released to the 36 states, and this two billion naira is tied to 50,000 bags of rice at the price of 40,000 per bag that will be distributed across board to cushion the effect of the astronomical rise food prices in the market. In addition to that, the government will also deploy 1 billion naira worth of maize to all the 36 states. As I speak to you, some states have already started receiving this uh, maize. And some states are using it directly to feed their people. Some states are also using the ones that is meant for feeds for livestock and poultry farmers and also to ensure that uh, the cost of uh, feeds is also reduced in the market. Very good question. If you listen to the presidential address when he addressed the nation, he made this promise that he will release food items, 
will release grains from the National Grain Reserve. They will procure CNG vehicles and electric vehicles. I serve in the committee that is following up this uh, action. And as I speak to you, procurement for CNG buses that will be distributed to states, a lot of progress has been made. Any moment from now, the federal government will start receiving some of those buses and they will be deployed to states. So they will act That arrangement to be able to attract assembling plants for those vehicles in Nigeria. Meaning that, apart from getting the buses, when the plants are also installed in, in Nigeria for the manufacture of these vehicles, to create jobs, there will be a value chain to recover our economy. There is, it will also be consistent with the National Economic Growth Plan. So for me, the federal government is doing very well, keeping to their promises. But, 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 but Governor Uzodama, in your own state of Imo, I know just how um, uh, trade conscious your people are. In terms of local production, in this very turbulent economic situation, what are you doing to revive production locally in Imo State? Are you thinking locally to empower the people of your state? You know, that is what I'm saying. You know, Nigeria is a federation. And at the state level, we are like the subnational, the federating units. There are peculiarities. In Imo State, for instance, I've started recovering all the moribund industries. I've started creating jobs. As at the last count, within the last six, 12 months, I've empowered over 25,000 youth in digital skills, equipped them, and they have started their own businesses. In the next nine days, I will empower and equip 15,000 young men and women, in fact, 20,000 young men and women different types of uh, digital skills. I have the most robust digital platform that is meant to bring up youth to start their own businesses, to, start, to also advance and learn some in one form of skill or the other in such a manner that they can also be employed. Um, by last week, we've gotten out of uh, the last 5,000 young men and women that we graduated. Over 1,800 work for now international companies abroad. One, one skill or the other, digital skill. And they're earning foreign exchange. They're earning salaries. So we are trying to create prosperity consistent with the manifesto of President Mohammed, uh, President Bolad Metinembo. So we are, what, the way, what is the situation in Imo State may not be exactly the situation in other states. I've recovered that Adapam. Other palm is the largest palm oil plantation in West Africa, built for the past 47 years. I have recovered that palm. As I speak to you now, we produce over 250 uh, metric tons of oil on daily basis. And we are expanding that palm plantation, planting new uh, palm seedlings. I know. Okay, uh, we are also building a, a palm kernel oil refinery. We are, doing, we are diversifying. We are into agriculture. We are into poultry. We are into pig. We are now revamping our ceramic factory because we have the best clay in Imo State. We are also considering building a cement plant. A cement plant in Okigwe. So we are uh, trying to create jobs. If the solution and the shortest way to recover our economy is to tackle unemployment, engage our young men and women, Give them busy to be productive. It is only when we are productive that we can have an economy. Time has come for us to begin to wear our thinking cap, to think differently, think positively, reduce lamentation and agitation, then confront the challenges before us as a people. It is not about government. It's not about Mr. President. It's about our country. Collectively, we must decide to recover our country. You may not like the face of the man in power. You may not like the face of the president. But you should listen to him and see, uh, understand whether he's making some sense, whether he's committed. The commitment I have seen 
from President Bola Metunim and his desire and passion to recover the economy of this country and drive this country forward and put the country in the path of growth is so strong and impeccable that every reasonable mind in the country must jump and follow. And this is how many days, just less than 70 days, a president. And people have certain lamentation here and there. That I think we should be positive thinkers and think correctly as citizens. Because our interest, the interest of the country, the national interest, is very important. We should be looking for leaders who are creative thinkers, who have done it before, so that they will be encouraged to do it again. Look at the economy of Lagos State. Uh, uh, the economy of Lagos in 1998. Yeah, governor. 1998, before Bola became the governor in 1999. Let me jump in quickly. The between now. Yeah, let me yeah. jump in quickly, if I may. So, I mean, in all of this that you have uh, touched on, uh, in respect of, uh, to the economy, uh, there are those who will believe that, okay, yeah, uh, it's good to revive this, it's good to bring these moribund companies and industries back on stream. But, but then, how much of revenue are you hoping that this will generate? How much of a turnaround would this be to the economy? What are you projecting in terms when of I figures? The governor into, by, by, 19, by 2020, January 15, when I assumed office as the governor of Imo State, we have a, an entirely generated revenue of less than 450 million naira. As I speak to you, we are hitting very close to 3 billion naira. It is, that is called creative thinking. That is called economic growth. We will continue to make efforts. I am trying to automate the process of land allocation to ensure tenement rates are paid, land use charges are paid. A new legislation has just been passed by my House of Assembly. When I deploy that into my revenue net, it will almost double the economy, the revenue we are getting now. So we sit down and think how to make great wealth. Not how to consume and complain. So, so Governor Ozodema, yeah, on, on one, yeah, on one hand, you're talking about the economy, but are you worried about the state of uh, security in your state? Uh, Army is thinking of deploying over two thousand soldiers for election alone in Imo State. That is worrying, isn't it? Uh, one of the governorship uh, candidates, the PDP governorship candidate, was quoted to have said that Imo is gradually becoming a Boko Haram state. That is alarming, isn't it? Well, I must tell you, uh, uh, Shem, the candidate, or PDP candidate, who spoke that he wants to be the governor of Imo state so that he can make Imo safe again. But uh, I want you to put it on record that this young man has been going around campaigning in Imo State, from one local government to the other, and has never been molested one day. And put it on record again, that since 2021, when insecurity started in Imo State, none of his colleagues, no member of his party, no member of his campaign organization or political family has been attacked or killed. 90% of those who have been killed are APC members. Now, he is now making it clear and when he becomes the governor, insecurity will stop in Imo State and Imo will be safe again. Meaning that until he becomes the governor, he will not stop what he's doing now. That is making other members of the party, particularly APC, to die. I will stop at that, but think about it. Oh, but you have said in the past that uh, politics is largely behind the insecurity in your state. But then you have still not come out to name the names of those who are killing innocent people in your state. And you have inferred that other p politicians, other than the ones in your political party, are the ones behind insecurity in the most state. Who are these people? Why can't you unveil them? Well, you know, I sit here as the governor. I've charged the security agencies in the most state. Go after and fish out those behind the killings in the most state. But it is not a coincidence. That the majority of the people being killed are the, those in government. It's not a coincidence that many people that are being killed are members of my party, APC. It is not also a coincidence that only lately, only last month, prominent members of my party 
that they participated in the last presidential election, that their houses are being attacked. Some traditional rulers that have sympathy for our party, their houses are being also attacked. So this attack of, or this kind of insecurity that is targeted on one political party alone, well, I, have, I continue to ask security agencies to tell me the reason behind it. But when people now begin to campaign, and they are not saying that the governor of Imo State is not building infrastructure. They are not saying that the governor of Imo State is not performing. They are not saying that the governor of Imo State is not paying salaries. They are not saying that the pensioners are not being paid. But they are saying that when they become the governor, Imo will be safe again. Then it, you know what that means. That's a child cries in the night, and the day the devil is lying lifeless. So I want to maybe use your medium to plead with these people who are behind the killings in Imo State. Political violence, the violence in Imo State, maiming and kidnapping of human beings in Imo State, in the name of politics, to stop. I say these times with that number, that the insecurity in Imo State is politically contrived. And those who are behind them, they know themselves. But I can bet you, too, few weeks' time, what we have deployed now will soon unravel those behind the community. Mm. And go, go, the governor, who's them are, yeah. governor, who's of them are? Yeah. Governor, who's of them are? Those who are eyeing your seat and they have sworn and, uh, and promised that they will chase you out of the government house. They will defeat you going into that election. Abga says they are ready. The PDP says they are coming back to power in Imo State. In fact, the Labour Party says it's going to come like a tsunami and sweep Opus Odema out of the government house. Do you think your party is in trouble in Imo State? Can you withstand this opposition coming your way in November 11? The mandate I have here is the mandate of the people of Imo State. If you want to chase a governor out, it's not by sponsoring killings. We want to remove a governor from his seat. It is not by burning houses of human beings. It is by coming to talk to Imo people to vote for you on the day of election. As long as that is not being done, it is no longer democracy. The democracy is about the people. I don't have the mandate of an individual. I don't have the mandate of an opposition party. I have the mandate of the entire Imo people who voted for me massively. And from what is on ground today, and the political feelings and discussions here and there, I think I'm almost confident that Imo people will vote for me again. I'd like to anchor on this. I thought that I saw a picture of yourself, former Governor Rocha Sokorocha, the national chairman of your party, uh, Senator Abdullah Ganduje, and one would think that uh, all is well, uh, in the family of the APC, but what we are hearing, it does appear that information uh, has it that Richard Sokorocha may not be working with the APC or Hopus or Dema. Uh, that is what some people think in your party. Uh, that is a big, big, big loss for your party and your chance of re getting a re election. Are you worried about that? Well, what I know is that the leadership is not about members of your party. It's about citizens of Imo State. And you, those who know me know me as a man of peace. I'm not at war with anybody. Which as Okrocha, you know, is my own brother from the same senatorial zone. He called that the Senate seat that left to become governor, the Senate seat that Rich as Okrocha occupied. You know, so we are not fighting, we are brothers, we are friends. We belong to the same political party. And I have no reason not to embrace him, whether in the villa, in Imo State, in his house, or in my house. So democracy is also about the people, movement of the people, by the people, and for the people. So this is it. I don't think I'm at war. And it is not also, there is no law that says that all the indigenous of Imo State must support a governor for somebody to become a governor. Democracy is that some people will agree, some will not agree. But as long as majority agrees, uh, you will become the governor. We, we need to go, Governor Uzodema. But I, I'm imagining that 
is a political tactics to uh, nominate or get a woman as a running mate. Is that it? To sway votes, isn't it? Well, the, you know that uh, the state, the local circumstances here, requires that uh, we must do some kind of balance. And of late, you know, women are more in numbers when it comes to issue of vote and the youth. So, in the wisdom of the party this time around, a decision that was collectively taken, both to the current deputy of the and also the leadership of the party, that my second term is easier and better for the entire more people, for inclusiveness, to have a female deputy. And that is the decision of the party, and it's acceptable to all, all the members of the party and the leadership. All right. Governor Ope Uzadema, thank you so much indeed for your time, and I wish you the very best, and yourself and the people of Imo State. Thank you so much indeed for your time tonight. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And that's our show for tonight. Everyone, many thanks for watching. I'll see you on Sunday at 8 p.m. I'm sure Akimale. God bless Nigeria.